Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Rob Saunderson. I'm a system architect, and uh, my co-presenter here has actually been doing the bulk of the work is Brian Worth. He's a software developer. We're both with the uh, MBSC development team in product systems within Boeing, and uh, we develop software solutions for model-based systems engineering engineers to design, to model, to simulate uh, a lot of different development programs within Boeing. Brian's going to be presenting today on our topic that's going to talk about how we want to use Mark Logic. We think it's one of the better solution for us to use to be able to collect and manage very large data sets that we have within the MBSC space. Hello? Okay. All right. Hopefully there's no echo. So I'm going to talk about a system that hopefully never has to be deployed on an aircraft. But it's there just in case, um, which is the RAT. So unfortunately, in uh, 1983, there was a Boeing 767 that was flying out of Canada that only received half the amount of fuel that was needed for the flight. So halfway through, they lost both their engines. So how were they still able to fly? And that is because of the RAT. The RAT is a ram air turbine that is um, based on the force of the air is going to generate enough power to keep all the f critical flight systems uh, in check. So one of the many requirements that we've got from the FAA is here. Um, and this one is all about making sure that the plane is controllable in the event of an engine, fa of engine failure. So we use SysML, which is a systems modeling language, which is an extension of the unified modeling language, UML, um, in order to describe and contextualize all of these different areas from our uh, requirements, the functional, the logical, and the actual product uh, breakdowns. Um, ooh, sorry. So from the FAA, from our customers, and our own internal requirements, we've got about 50,000 um, of these requirements, which are then decomposed into lower tier requirements to about 5 million. So it gets pretty, pretty intense. From there, we break those down into their own individual functions, um, which adds more complexity into the entire system. And then from there, we've got the logical aspects of those functions. So a propulsion system or power to, for the functionality. And then the logical, right, the, uh, the battery that would be used and the engine that could be used. And then on top of that, we have the actual product that would essentially be used. So like the, the Trent 1000, which we use as the engine for, their, for the, uh, the 787, or you know, any of the, uh, the fuselage parts, um, communication systems, you name it. Then customers are able to choose between a wide variety that they would want to have on their aircraft to, feed, to fit their needs. So it can get very complex, a lot of different paths that you can take to satisfy individual ones. Um, and especially with the, the rate that we do, especially with the 737, where they're pumping out essentially two of, two of them a day, uh, I mean, it, it gets a lot. And there's a lot of data because we have to make sure that we can trace back to the actual product to satisfy the requirements that says that it is airworthy. So for example, right, let's say hypothetically this was the requirement for power. And we could trace it all the way back to the individual component, unless you know, we needed to switch out because cost, weights, whatever, whatever was needed. So how are we using all of that data in order to, uh, to figure everything out? So we, we need to break down all of those different links from the SysML 
from the data. Um, so we can run um, performances, queries to figure out those what-if scenarios, like what if they wanted to use a different engine? Would they still be able to get the certain range that they were looking for? If they had a different battery, would they be able to keep the same capacity? Um, those kind of things. Or, in the case of the rat, if the systems were to both fail, would this still be able to deploy? So we can run the simulations in a tool that we use for our modeling, which is um, No Magic Cameo, which we're going to um, which is what we use to, to model out all of these different systems. Um, and all the information is then stored through our uh, model management system, MMS, into the, our MarkLogic backend. So we're using uh, MarkLogic to generate the, um, the RDF graphs, the Sparkle triples, doing the triple management, uh, large base queries, complex queries, um, and all that. Uh, OpenMBE is a community project that was started by JPL. Um, it's targeted to help um, co teams collaborate against the large scale projects. Um, other people that use, are using it are Lockheed Martin, Ford, um, and us, obviously. Um, so why is it that we wanted to use MarkLogic? Uh, again, it's sort of supporting those RDF and the Sparkle standards for the W3 standards. Um, we only want to manage the, uh, the information inside of the document, not have to also manage the massive amounts of triples and the links between all of the, uh, the relations. So that's all, you know, that's a capability that's straight out of the box. We wanted the, the solution to be scalable. Um, and to also keep all of our historic data and so we can also go back um, and look at any point in time um, to see how things have changed and learn from, from that. Um, uh, the, uh, the collection management was a very, very useful thing that we, uh, that we were wanting to have. And uh, yeah, any questions? Oh, one in the in the back. Uh, you, I remember the uh, fuel problem. Mm -hmm. Did you guys write software to calculate uh, how much fuel you need? I mean, it was the difference between meter and gallon. Yeah, so it was the first flight um, from Canada switching their metric system. So initially they had thought that it was the fuel gauge that was wrong, but they figured out that on the ground that the software and the gauges there weren't converted over for fueling the aircraft. But yes, since then, they've been able to, to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Yes. Can we wait on questions? Or, or are you done? Yeah. You're ready for questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. super. Then raise your hand so I can get a microphone to you. I told you it wasn't going to take very long. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, how big is this implementation? Means the size of the data? Um, well, right now we're, we're still in our development for getting it into a production ready environment. Um, I know right now we're trying to stream a minimum of uh, 500,000 documents for commits um, for any given time. So if that kind of helps in scale, but we don't really have a full idea of how 30, 30, 40 gigs. Ooh, that also is it's still in work. We're, uh, we're still trying to really define the ontology that's going to be used for all of our triples. So don't really have a clear answer for you. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll come back next year with our production system to describe what we've actually been able to implement. Yeah. What is the reporting tool you're using? Um, the reporting tool for which aspect, essentially? Right. When, uh, how, how, how do you use this MarkLogic database? Well, right now we're using um, the MarkLogic data in conjunction with the Cameo application. So Cameo is talking back and forth with MarkLogic to retrieve all of the documents that have been stored for that particular project. 
and it's doing a verification and commits to all MarkLogic and also Teamwork Cloud. Well, yeah, so we're using Sparkle to view the graphs, but we're also working on how to get a graphical representation of the contextual links. Okay. Anyone else? Hands? Hands in the air? Oh, here you go, sir. Thanks. Hi. Um, could you give an example of some of the queries people are running on the system? You mentioned, you know, making this available and people, people be, being able to search for different relationships. Right. So we're still, again, we're still in our development efforts in trying to get this to work. Um, so we're currently working on a, a front end that would allow a user to write a Sparkle statement or to essentially um, build out the graph that they would like to have so that they would be able to drag in, an, uh, drag in the object, see the predicates that it's got, and then the associated you know, um, subjects or objects that are, uh, that are aligned on those predicates. So this way they can, the graph itself would be able to generate the Sparkle query. Just, just going back to like the rat and the plane, mm -hmm. just what, what in, in terms of the real world product side will they be able to put together to get, that, to get an, an answer or, or access to a particular piece of uh, information they didn't have before? So just kind of like a real world query about like the rat, for instance. Uh. Our engineers do the simulation work, so it's just a matter of um, when the when the system is developed. Make sure I don't make that thing buzz. At <laughs> when the when the system is developed, uh, just making sure that we're able to use the data across all the different disciplines, the combination of all the data to be able to run different types of simulations to prove out. So, like the rat, under what conditions will it deploy? Which conditions do you, you don't want it to deploy inadvertently? Uh, you want it to deploy and produce the right amount of power depending on which craft it's on. So it's just being able to bring data in across multiple projects and tie it all together. Um, yeah, so we've got several external systems besides Cameo that actually feeds the data and are, are looking to um, make use of the data that's in there for whatever, whatever their needs are. And not, honestly, not all of them are defined yet. We have an idea of what who's going to want what, but it hasn't all gotten tied together just yet. We're really early in our development right now. And being that low level for me, <laughs> I just do. And can you compare and contrast the, the performance impacts of, of your earlier pilots, which you guys are seeing now, and how that impacts your, your engineering flow? And it's it, around the ability to, to run a model. Uh, I don't know if we're actually there yet. <laughs> yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're not quite. Yeah, sorry, we're not we're not quite there yet. But I know from some of our older systems, not completely related to what we're working on here, we've run on different verification and what we call auditing of the data. On um, some of those systems would take uh, eight hours, a full day, to be able to run through an entire airplane configuration. On um, because we have uh, some of our systems, they do three, four, five thousand 5,000 different types of checks, signal monitoring, uh, making sure uh, wire connectivity, uh, requirements validation, all that kind of stuff going through there. Uh, the expectation, there has, Alec did run some, I think he did run some early checks on some. We're expecting some of these things that might, might have taken a day that we're going to get down to easily less than an hour. So huge, it would be a huge savings. Just the type of querying alone with a three-dimensional data model versus relational data, it's, it's, it's just massive savings. Coffee break instead of open up stairs. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and overnight, hoping that the system doesn't have a hiccup and have to start again. So, yeah, and with the, with the increase of rate uh, that we're doing on, on several, several different models, it's really going to help out be, get the flow going through. Going. Rob, you might just want to stay up here. I'm going to be quick. Um, you have more of the architecture. So when you were architecting your 
system, how, what was the decision process that made you settle around MarkLogic as opposed to a competitive technology? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was really, I actually asked Alex that question. Yes, I was going to say, because Alex really knows the answer. Yeah, because he did the trade study on all that. Yeah, Alec actually couldn't make it uh, to, uh, to this conference. But uh, when I asked him that question, um, he said a lot of it had to do, so there's other graph databases um, that can do queries, Sparkle queries. A lot of it had to do with our ability to manage those triples effectively in documents. Because um, the, the model based systems engineering model, which has multiple domains. It's got the requirements domain, it's got yeah. the uh, logical domain, uh, sorry, functional uh, domain, logical domain, yeah. physical domain. Um, each one of the, the nodes, all of those things are related to each other, but each one of the nodes in that is uh, like an object that has multiple properties. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like a, it's a system, right? And there's actually hierarchical relationships between those objects too, because for example, on the slide you had there, you had wing and then you had engine under wing, yeah. you know, for example. So um, the ability to just model an object and all of the properties of that object in one unit and be able to check that in and check that out and change it atomically and not have to worry about you know, what are all the different triples that need to be invalidated in, in the graph if I'm gonna make a change for an engine component to be able to just change that engine component in uh, Magic Draw, I think it is? Uh, no, Cameo? It's Cameo. Cameo, no and, yeah, no and have all the triples automatically update in real time so that you can always query the graph consistently. That was the major, that's what he told me anyway, that was the yeah. major decision point. Okay, there were some more hands over here. Uh, choosing what you run this on, do you, did you pick the cloud? Did you pick dedicated servers? Uh, what did you choose and, and to do that, and why did you choose it? I will defer to Mr. Architect. <laughs> I just implement the system. <laughs> so, so actually, our, our choice was a, a, an on-premises solution to begin with, primarily because it was what's available. <laughs> We, we're actually piggybacking on another project within the company. We're sharing the same resources. I believe our goal on very soon, perhaps June or July, is to start moving towards a cloud solution on just for scalability more than anything. On, but yeah, it, it was just a matter of convenience for our original choice. On, we don't, I'm still collecting data to fully understand what our, our data set's gonna look like. On, I suspect what we do have for our infrastructure isn't going to be able to support the amount of data we have. Thus, the cloud solution is really going to help out for that scaling. Mm -hmm. That's what I was saying. Yeah, this is related to uh, security. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand, like uh, your MarkLogic database also will be accessed using a a back, right? A B A C. Mm -hmm. How the integration between Mark Logic and uh, uh, attribute based access control? That for Sema. So, for some of the systems, including Mark Logic, we, uh, as you mentioned, that we have role based access control embedded into systems. Um, but we are trying to externalize decision, externalize decision making in many of our applications from the ERP, PLM, EMOM domains. For MarkLogic, we are we have specific capability utilizations right around the metadata management as well as the housing R policies. And internally, we are aware that MarkLogic is utilizing uh, role-based access control, but as uh, we are discussing in deep dive sessions to how we can elevate that security for the attribute-based access control as well. So they're providing support to us to get our requirements, understand how we can go there together. Any other questions? So Sima, I had another one for you. Um, so you talked about the the security landscape inside and outside. Can you just can you give people a sense of the numbers and the types and the complexity of that? Like how many different roles or how many different users 
and, and some of the security that goes into the projects that you work on? So um, if we are looking into the groups of um, attributes, like we say identity groups or role groups, we have thousands of roles in the company. And if you look at the system, like uh, ERP may have different sets of roles, EMOM may have different sets of rules and roles, and uh, PLM differently. So basically putting together, even if just looking at the roles, thinking just the role-based access control, that requires intensive role mapping activity. So what one system defines in an admin, is it the same in another system? If one system says like admin can do basically everything, does it mean admin can do everything in another system as well? So this is very complicated activity to map the roles, map the attributes, one system to another. It is not going to be done in a month. It's going to take a year, couple of years to even uh, elevate our security to the attribute-based access control. So the good news is some of the components, because we are enforcing the uh, microservices approach, they, we already stand up as a service capability. So meaning our policies, uh, policy administration point capability already available. Our policies can be utilized by through that calling that specific service by any other application out there to try it out for best fit or capability. Our metadata uh, capability through the service enablement, again, available to all of this application. So there is different layers of maturity existing with the global data access capability right now. We are also procuring an additional technology for the decision engine. So that's also wrapping up, I, I believe, mid of this year. So that part will be the last component in the chain to bring the global data access to production. Okay, we have time for one more oh, question. Here we go. Um, how big is your data uh, in terms of storage or um, and capacity, capacity-wise? Do you have any archiving strategies going forward uh, if it grows? You said that 50, 500K per minute, you said, ingestion into the mark logic? Well, we want to be able to account for that kind of throughput um, in terms of an overall capacity number. I don't think we've actually <laughs> have a, a true mind in sight, unless you know something I don't, Ralph. Yeah, we currently, uh, just considering our projects that are being developed in Cameo and are being modeled, we've got about 30 to 40 gig of data on, um, but the way we're doing, the, what we're doing for storage, we're storing in, in Mark Logic as well, not just in, in Team Center, which is the native storage for, um, for Cameo, but we're, we're storing all the versions, so every change that's being made is being stored so we can keep track of all the relations and all that kind of stuff. So you think of 30 to 40 gig and any given project's got 100 plus engineers working on it, making changes consistently. It, we're, yeah, we're looking a couple hundred gig just in the early, just in the early days, yeah. It's not just the size of the data, but the number of triples as well. That's yeah. that's where some of the complexity comes in, right? Yeah. Because, you know, when you're talking about uh, all of the systems on like a 787 um, and tying all of those physical systems to their logical domain, their functional domain, and all of their requirements, which are, you know, two million parts on the system and, you know, you said I think a couple hundred thousand requirements or something like that. No. Um, and then maintaining every version of that from every check-in from every engineer, it starts to get to be a lot of triples. And um, one of the, if you go back to the why mark logic slide, uh, here it is, um, you see additional features that they're looking at using, things like temporal queries um, and collections and things like that to scope the Sparkle queries to particular check-ins or particular branches mm -hmm. uh, because these models are branched and checked in and out like code. Right, and so there's a lot. Think of each engineer as like a developer, branching and checking and forking and and, and merging code, um, and being able to do queries on the graph at any sort of check-in point on any branch is important. And MarkLogic's ability to scope the number of triples 
involved in the query based on which collection you're looking at or which time slice that you're interested in so that it keeps the number of triples um, involved in a query constant even as the size of the overall triple corpus increases um, is the important part of you know, scalability and performance when he says accumulation of historical data does not affect query performance. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. That makes sense? Hopefully that made sense. Well said. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's hear it for our customer. Thank you so much.